All right. So let's start just by talking about what we're going to talk about. Um, Kalman filtering is always taught from Kalman's original paper and then going forward in time. And that's kind of confusing. So I'm actually going to start with what we can do today, now that we have big computers that can do whatever we want really quickly, and go backwards in time to see original equations. We'll talk about the equations. If you ask someone you know, what a Kalman filter is, Okay, so I can go right over here. Okay, you know what you might get is something like this, like uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> is there something I'm doing wrong with this, Chuck? You put it at an angle. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll see a bunch of equations, and some will say, there, that's a Kalman filter. Do you understand it now? Right. Um, and you don't, and I didn't. And when I started doing Kalman filtering here, I did it for uh, Professor Garcia's perching aircraft. So uh, this thing would change its shape as it flew, and we needed to be able to understand what was going on in the aircraft as it flew. And I made a Kalman filter, and yeah, it worked. But it was terrible. I look back on it; it's kind of it's kind of embarrassing. Like it, it worked, but man, it took a lot longer than it needed to take. Um, it would eventually have had numerical problems that I didn't know how to address. And generally, you know, I had equations like this, and I felt like those were more or less magic that somebody cooked up, and I could follow these magic equations, and they give me good answers. And to to a small degree, that's true. But to a good degree, we can get past this, and we can get to an understanding much, much, much more easily. So. By, the, by starting with something that doesn't involve these equations at all, we're going to work backwards in time, and then we're going to get somewhere where actually we can look at these equations and completely understand these equations. Okay? <clears throat> cool. So I'm just going to erase these for now because I don't have that much real estate on the uh, screen. So. Kalman filtering is part of recursive state estimation. So there's some state of things that we care about, and we're trying to understand what's happening with those things over time. And we start kind of ignorant of them, and then we learn a little bit more, and we learn a little more, and we learn a little bit more. But of course, they're changing, and they're changing, and they're changing. So we want to be able to determine what's going on. So if there was some system that we cared about, we could, like, let's say that we knew where an airplane was. Airplane. Okay, and we, we believe that this airplane is going this way, but we're not really sure. It might be going a little bit this way, it might be going a little bit this way. And we're trying to understand what's happening with it right now and where it'll be later. So, what can we do about that? Well, we could just simulate it a bunch of times. Let's just simulate every possible thing that the plane could be doing. And then we'll take a measurement later, and if that measurement matches up with the thing that we predicted for one of those simulations, we'll say, ah, this simulation was correct. Okay. So here we go. You know, this guy's turning, this guy is, you know, flying in loops, whatever. And so we say, if this is true, when I take my observation, I expect to see him here. Otherwise, I expect to see him here, 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 here. Then I take the real observation, and it's here. Okay. So I assume, all right, it's kind of like these two guys. Right? So he's probably like leaning a little bit right on the stick and returning a little bit. So let's, let's make this a more in-depth example. But the idea here is we're going to simulate, we're going to use this observation to tell us what's really going on. And I think this is a lot easier with a bouncing ball. So we think a bouncing ball is here. We think the bouncing ball is here. Uh, yeah, but we're not really sure about that. It might be, might be right here. Might be right here, might be right here, right here. Little bit less often, we'll be pretty wrong, it'll be way out here. Okay, and then, then really infrequently we'll be super wrong when the ball is out here. Okay. 
So let's say that I believe, you know, about 50% or so that the ball is here, maybe like 0.01 that the ball is up here, um, maybe 0.1 that the ball is one of these, and then, you know, divide up the rest for those other four or whatever. So I have a notion for each one of these little balls, these little bouncing balls. And here's the ground. And so what I can do is simulate the motion of each ball. So along with its position, maybe we assume a little velocity. Okay, so if I simulate all of these, we'll have and we're simulating these for some amount of time, some dt. So this will be dt later. Okay, so we've simulated all of these things. And now we get a real observation for the system. And we see that the observation is right here. So we say as well, I had 50% confidence in this guy. And then I simulated it forward. So this guy is about 50%. And how likely is it, because my observations aren't perfect, how likely is it that if this is where he really is, that's the observation? So maybe we'll say, you know, that's a really small distance. You know, that's inside of like one sigma for my observation accuracy or whatever. So we'll say, okay, you know what? Um, maybe that's like 0.8 likely. And then, you know, this is like 0.7 likely here. This is like pretty unlikely. That's like 0.2. And this thing is just not really feasible. You know, this is, you know, um, one over a million or whatever. Um, so this one already had 0.01 as its likelihood. So we have about a 1% likelihood here, divided by a million. This thing is just not very likely right now. This one had a pretty good likelihood. Maybe multiply that by 0.8. We get some sort of utility. So for each of these, we take its likelihood, and we just multiply it by this number right here, and we get a utility for what that is. So this one will be like 0.4, right? Which is pretty good compared to 0 .0000001. Um, maybe this one. I think that was actually my original ball, not my final ball, but maybe this one was 0.1, and that's like 0.1, so this is now 0.01. So we get this sort of utility score for each of these things. The higher utility, the more likely that's what was going on. Um, so once we have those, we can take some sort of weighted position, average of these things, and say, okay, you know, the ball's most likely actually right here. And so that's my estimate. After one step, my estimate is sort of the weighted position of all of these things, where this one is completely unimportant from its utility weight. This one's pretty important. We get that maybe the ball is right about here. So that's pretty simple. Yeah, all we're doing is just maintaining a little likelihood for each ball, simulate each ball, and then how likely was that observation given the simulation of that ball? Really simple. And then each ball has a little score. So we're almost done, okay? Now the only thing we do is we say, I want another measurement sometime later. You know, the ball's gonna keep on bouncing, I'm gonna make another measurement sometime in the future. So we can take all of these little balls and we can generate a new spread, kind of like this. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that we can do this. One way that you might recognize is based on a genetic algorithm would actually be really simple to just say, what I'm going to do is just sort of uh, pick balls at, at random, but according to their probability. So if this is 0.01 and this is 0.4, if I pick a whole bunch of balls, I'll pick this one 40 times as often as I'll pick this one. So we pick all those and we, we put our new little balls in place. Um, so maybe we have 40 of them right here. We have one right here. This guy never gets selected. This guy gets selected about 30 times or so. And then we take each ball and we just per perturb it a little bit. Maybe sort of randomly. So you're just talking about a particle filter, right? We're getting there, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. I was just making, like... All right. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Cool. So we'll end up with 40 little balls right here, but then we perturb each one just sort of randomly. We just take a random draw, small number, 
So one ball goes a little bit over here, one's over here, one's over here, one's over here, one's over here. And then since we've drawn all these, we have 40 balls right here and one ball right here. That means they're all now equally likely. Okay. Um, so we go back and we say, you know what, instead of all of these previous likelihoods that we have, just say this guy, if we have 100 balls, this guy is 0.01, this guy is 0.01, this guy is 0.01, this guy is 0.01. And then continue. Simulate each one of those forward, get a new observation, see how likely that is, determine the score, make a weighted average, it gives you a position, and then select the highest scores and inform your next generation of these little balls. That's it. That's a fantastic filter. It can solve all sorts of problems. We didn't make any assumptions about what this distribution here looked like. So we know we're ignorant, but we don't know the shape of our ignorance here, and we don't need to. Um, and we didn't make any assumptions really about what the dynamics are doing. This doesn't have to be smooth. This can be some sort of weirdo equation. It can involve integers. You know, it's fine. Um, so that is an excellent estimator. It's called a particle filter. You can use it for anything. How you weight these things and make a new little generation of, of particles, the balls here are the particles, how you do that is uh, where you want to specialize. But overall, this is the guts of every particle filter. And this is what's taught last in the textbook. I think this should be taught first in the textbook, because this is way easier than common filtering. Um, so what's the downside of doing this? Can anybody see an obvious downside? Computationally expensive. Yeah, it's computationally expensive. I said we had 100 balls. Um, 100 balls are probably not going to really give us anything on a problem that's in any way significant. It's very common in particle filtering that you'd have a thousand, ten thousand, a million of these. So now every single time step, you want to run a million simulations, you know, lots of random draws and things like this. And that, of course, is difficult. Um, so these are great for offline things, and they're great when we don't know anything at all about our uncertainty, about our noise. Uh, we can just simulate everything and see what happens. Yeah? It might be a little out of the scope, but how do you decide? How do you use distance? Like, how do you decide on a distance metric for figuring out which particles are closest to your observations? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if you could hear that over here, um, banana and Aviram. But the question <laughs> was, uh, how do you decide? I think you're talking about this number right here. How do I decide that that's like 0.8 likely? Yeah. Right, or something like that. Okay. Perfect question. Is this is where we need to make some assumption or have some amount of information on the uncertainty. If this is Gaussian, if I say that my observation is, uh, is the truth, I'm gonna write my observation right over here. Okay, so let's call the observation of the state. Let's say the position and velocity combined are stored in a vector, and we'll call that x. Okay, we'll say the observation is z. That's some function of x, of course. Um, and then it's some function of x plus noise, right? Uh, so what is this noise? What's the shape of that noise? If it's Gaussian, it's very easy to figure out this right here. Uh, if it's not Gaussian, you just have to ask, what, is, what distribution do you expect from your observations? Um, you have to have some information. If your observation is just, I pick a random number out of you know, all reals, and I give that to you, that doesn't really inform you over here. Right. So it's, uh, it's diffuse. All of your simulations are equally likely because you don't know anything about your observation. But, but if you're working with actual sensor data, so mm -hmm. you're not even observe, you're, you're observing a proxy for the state, mm -hmm. uh, then different, you have to take into account, like, I guess the question is like, where does the sensor model come in here? Do you normalize? for sensors, if so, how? Okay, cool. Um, that's always so let's easy. look at one thing. Let's just look at an example. Okay. Yeah, let's look at an example. So I said, okay, we simulate all of these things forward, and then we assign a likelihood right here. And the ones that were highest likelihood were the ones that went bounce and bounce and ended up right here. But let's say we had some weirdo particle over here, which is just barely on the screen, okay? And, and so he's pretty far away from the pack and we don't really know its velocity very well at all. Um, and this one goes to right here, okay? Um, 
Well, that's really close to our observation. So this guy was kind of far out, but now he's ended up really close to the observation. So we actually have two different spaces that are um, a very high likelihood in the end. All I know is that's what I observed. Is it, is it this one or is it, or is it this one? It's actually more likely that it's this one at the moment. Um, so when I said, you know, this is sort of the most likely position, cool. What about the velocity? What's the most likely velocity? We're now averaging things whose velocity here goes like this and like this. And if we were to sort of think about this as a, an n-dimensional, like four-dimensional space, two position, two velocity, we would find, I'm just going to kind of do this as two dimensions. We would find that there are places where we sort of have peaks, and then we have this one sort of freak over here where that has a peak as well. Okay, so this is like position x, y, and then likelihood kind of going this way. So we'll end up with these sorts of things. On the observation, that's where you just need to know something about how you're observing it. So um, observe something you know for a little while with that sensor and see what sort of noise that sensor is giving you. Does it look Gaussian? Does it look, you know, like uh, he square? Just look through it, um, and you can make some assumptions. So my thing here isn't actually to go into like really awesome particle filter design. It's to get the, the architecture of these problems down. Okay. So I kind of want to yeah, move sure. along. These are awesome. You're right on where you need to be, though. Cool. All right, so I want to start the ball problem over again. And now I am going to make a few assumptions. Is this what a GPS board would do if it was trying to solve the energy ambiguity problem? Because it has a bunch of competing hypotheses about where the energies lie. Cool. So Ryan's asked a great question. Is this how you might... Because um, it does do something and it goes down through a couple thousand to one. And I, Is this how yeah. it does it? Um, he's asking a question about uh, GPS resolving into a final position and velocity estimate. Um, and there are multiple ways that the waveforms can give you a solution, which is actually the most solution. It's kind of like the sort of bimodal thing we had up here, but we'll have a lot of little modes. Um, this is one way that you could do it for GPS. It's not what I believe that they do. Um, but yeah, you absolutely could. And the only reason is GPS are usually on dinky little boards that have terrible processors, and so they want to run something that's a lot faster. They probably run something called um, some sort of multi-model multi filter. They're probably just running several filters simultaneously and picking the one who's doing the best. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's a particle filter. Let's reset. Uh, we're still going to have a bouncing ball. But now let's make one assumption. And that assumption is that our uncertainty is also approximately Gaussian. Okay. So my best guess of where the ball is right now is right here. And instead of making a lot of particles, just filling up the whole space with particles, what I'm going to do is uh, spread particles out intelligently. Okay. So this is my best guess. This is sort of my mean guess of where the particles or, or where the ball is. Um, and we were to look at the probability, we might find we don't know much in this axis, but maybe we know much in this axis, so I'm kind of drawing ecky probable lines here. Okay, something more or less like this. So I can take a particle and move, like a particle, a point, and move it um, just like a thousandth of a sigma in one direction and a thousandth of a sigma in another direction. So I might have another ball here, and here, and here, and here, okay? And then really, I would, this is position. We would do the same for velocity if you can kind of extrapolate that in your head. So that's the idea. So now we have, if it were just position five balls, if it were velocity, we'd also have one here, here, and here, and here in the other two dimensions. Um, and we simulate them all again. So this guy goes, bounce to here. This one goes bounce to here. This one goes bounce to here, here, and here. And what we do is we, we take these. In fact, let's, let's make this a little different. Whoa. Okay. 
Let's say that one kind of ends up a little bit back this way. I don't know, maybe the ball has some backspin or something. Um, so now what we've ended up with is another little cloud over here. But again, we're assuming that our knowledge is Gaussian. So what we do is we take a weighted mean of each of these things um, in, in pretty much the same way. We get an observation. That observation might be right here. We create a little weighted mean for how well each of these does. Um, and we determine where is the most likely spot in here. So you can see if that was our original probability distribution, after we propagated, we have some other probability distribution. You know, and maybe that doesn't move perfectly. It's kind of like scooched to one side or something. Um, and we can form our, our best guess of the actual mean, which might not be represented by the mean. So the mean might not be the mean over here. Uh, so we have our best guess, and then we figure out, um, you know, what sort of damage is happening here, right? And we use that to weight the, the new points, these little points, to determine what we believe our new state is. And that's now our updated state. And when we start this over, we forget that we ever even had these guys. We take our new updated state, and we do the same thing. Intelligently place those little particles around it, and then run again. So the cool part here is that this is kind of like a particle filter. It's a particle filter plus the, uh, the assumption that we can do this, that we have sort of these equiprobable lines that go out. Remember how last time we had a particle over here? That just can't be represented here. It wouldn't really match. So um, uh, the only assumption we have is this. But whereas before we might have needed 1,000 or 2,000 or something particles, here if we have uh, four states, x, y, and then x dot, y dot, if we have four states, we're going to end up with nine particles. We're going to end up with the, the mean and then displace twice in each dimension. So we'll end up with only nine particles. And yet that tracks for the assumption that this is sort of Gaussian-ish, or at least multimodal, has one big lump of higher probability and it goes down from there. Um, nine particles is going to do just as good a job, in some cases a better job, than a particle filter. But we've reduced our workload extraordinarily. So this does not place any assumptions on the dynamics? Like they could be completely nonlinear and weird? Or yeah, this is a great question. Does this place assumptions on the dynamics? Um, not really. Okay. It, it places the assumptions that after you run this, this isn't total BS, but not much more than that. Um, you can see we have like a bounce in here, which is you know not continuous, right? So that's terrible. Um, it doesn't place really many requirements on that function at all. But if you had if you had some like weird dynamics field where one of those balls stayed in exactly the same place. Mm -hmm. Um, wouldn't that really affect? Yeah, yeah. So the question it is, really affect the mean, but I guess it would also make the mix sigma a lot bigger. Sure. Yes, yeah. that's how you do that. Excellent, excellent on both the question and the answer. Um, so, where does this fall apart? Is ultimately what the question is. Uh, if we had some sort of like crazy chaotic system, like we were talking about earlier or something, um, and your mean goes over here, and one point goes here, and one point goes here, and one point goes here, and this guy ends up over here. Like, wow, something really strange has gone on here. What's your uncertainty going to be? Your uncertainty is going to be enormous. What's interesting is that's what your uncertainty needs to be. It needs to be enormous. When you propagate this, the fact that this ended up over there kind of says, you don't have any idea what's going on in your system. So somewhere, if your uncertainty were smaller and smaller and smaller, and hopefully we'd be getting smaller over time if we're doing a good job, we would find that that guy didn't get all the way out there. If we had been just a little more certain, you know, he would have been right here. If we'd been a little more certain, he'd have been right here. And for infinitesimal uncertainty, he'd have been right here. Cool. So this works insofar as this maps to a um, uh, uh, unimodal distribution. Again, a big one big lump of probability, not like um, 
Uh, not like we have a bunch of little pins. And then we have two buckets. And balls fall down here and sort of chaotically go in one bucket or the other bucket. That would not be good here. That's not like a unimodal distribution in here. Okay. So this is actually the first time we're brushing on Kalman filtering. So what we'll do with uh, this sort of setup of particles uses the Kalman equations behind the scenes, but this is called unscented Kalman filtering. So it's called unscented because we are allowing this to be kind of any spread of particles over here. If we aren't sensing it, we're not assuming that this mean is the mean when things uh, are propagated into the future. We're allowing there to be like a new mean to come up. So unscented Kalman filtering is fantastically uh, useful all over the place because it is easy to compute relatively, certainly relative to the, uh, the particle filter, but it doesn't have all that many assumptions. It's pretty easy to put an unscented Kalman filter together. So if you have any problem where you think something is unimodal and, and you're uncertainty about it, um, and you can simulate it you know, halfway reasonably, you can build an unscented Kalman filter in a very small amount of time and quickly estimate it. So we can talk at the end about building the Kalman filter for violet, but the first thing that I built to determine how good we might possibly do with a Kalman filter running on violet is I built an unscented Kalman filter because it's so much easier to do. I don't have to calculate Jacobians or anything that you guys might have heard of. Okay. So let's actually narrow in a little bit further now. Let's make one more assumption. Uh, how does your uncertainty in the, the filter scale with your uncertainty in your model? Right? So like your model is some delta bad or some epsilon bad. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to some delta bad in, yeah. in your filter? That's great. Okay, so the question is uh, how does the uncertainty here actually become uncertainty in the in the real filter? So when we do our equations our update process. Mm -hmm. um, we will have x at sample k plus 1, okay, is some function of x at sample k. Right. Okay. Um, maybe it's also a function of time, you know, this could change over time. Um, and then maybe two, there's just plain noise in the system. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, just like we had noise in our observation, there's probably noise in the propagation. Is it windy? That's going to move the little ball, right? So we'll plug in some noise right here. When you're running an unscented Kalman filter, you propagate the middle guy without any noise. But when you make all these little particles, you actually generate noise for them. So the noise goes into the propagation. So how does the noise in the real problem end up becoming the noise in the filter? If there is noise, these will sort of deterministically move outward or inward or, or whatever it happens to be. So this will simply be bigger after propagation. I, I, I guess my worry is not about the noise in the propagation, but like if your F has non non white noise, Mm -hmm. Right, like you just got a constant wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, the question so is, yeah. The, the question is, um, our model doesn't match reality. What's the damage done? Yeah. Is that a correct? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Can we talk about that one later? Because yes. I think it's a great question. But we'll talk about it uh, after we've done a few of the other things. Cool. I might leave these equations up here. So now let's add another assumption. We're, we're going to go back to a ball. Okay. Um, but now we're going to say after this ball moves into the future, that it's still the middle of the uncertainty. Remember last time we didn't assume it was the middle of the uncertainty. When we had the ball way out here, that dragged the, the mean sort of over this way. Um, now we're going to say, I assume the uncertainty travels with this, and then maybe it expands or contracts some way but this is still the middle of it, 
okay, the top of the probability distribution. So I have some notion of the probability here. And then later, that probability will be very likely a little bit larger, and that's the middle. So that's one assumption. The other assumption that we can add at this point is that the motion of this from here to here is smooth and that we can differentiate it. Okay, so if we go back to our bouncing ball, this is not smooth. We can't differentiate what happens right here. Um, I could say the slope is, is this, or that would be kind of like a t minus. I could say that was the slope. And then a t plus, I can say that is the slope. So for the bouncing ball problem, we actually can't use the technique I'm talking about right now. But if we said the motion was smooth, and we could differentiate it everywhere, like let's say this is just a ball, here, let's get rid of the ground altogether. This is just the ball arcing through the air over to here. Of course I can differentiate this at any given moment. No big deal. So if this stays the mean, and I can differentiate this at any given moment, then what I can do is simulate one thing going forward, then I calculate uh, sort of these Jacobians to determine what that does to the uncertainty going forward. Okay, And um, this is where all those equations that we saw at first come in. We'll revisit the equation, but the idea is I just create a, a linear map of the uncertainty from here to here. And so that map basically says uncertainty gets bigger, uncertainty gets smaller. Okay? Um, but the difference is now I have one thing to simulate, and then I just have a little bit of linear algebra that I do, and that represents all of the rest of the uncertainty. So this is, in fact, generally a little faster than the unscented Kalman filter. This is now the extended Kalman filter. Cool? All right. So we've made it back about 50 years um, in about 30 minutes. That's okay. Um, so let's, let's take one more assumption here from the extended Kalman filter, and we'll come back and visit the equation. And that assumption is that um, x doesn't update as some crazy nonlinear function, which is fine for the extended Kalman filter, but what if we actually just had a linear system? Okay, so it just updates like that. That's now the regular Kalman filter. And uh, while no one actually works with a system uh, where something they care about looks like this, it actually is often possible to come up with something like a, a, an error off of your state that does work like this. And we can look a little bit more about coming up with error states and things and how those might be linear. Cool. So that would bring us all the way back to actual just linear Kalman filters. Okay. So now let's go ahead and let's look at some of those equations. I think we're prepared for this now. So we're going to keep the model here that um, there's a nonlinear function that updates over time. So remember, f is our simulation of what's going to happen. And let's say that the noise isn't some input right here. Just let's make it easier. Let's say that the noise just adds on to the state, okay? Cool. So what we want to do is represent the motion of x over time, and that's simple. If we have an estimate of x, we run our function, and we get our estimate of the updated x. No big deal. So that's the first step, run this. The second step is we want to update our uncertainty of what's going on here. And we want to do that with a bunch of linear maps and things. So how do we do that one? That one's maybe a little bit more complicated. So let's first talk about what the uncertainty is. So I, I, talk, I have that p variable written up here. p represents our dumbness of the problem. Right. So p. Did you just say the dumbness? Of yeah, the our problem? dumbness in right. the problem. Yep. Technical term for yeah. sure. Okay. All right. So uh, um, p is going to be the expected value of the error, okay, um, squared. So let's say that there were a true x out there, 
and that'll be one without a hat on it. And then there's our estimate of x, and that's going to be x with a hat on it. Okay. So um, the the error is going to be the true x minus x with a hat. Um, so what we want to know is what this is. Okay. So if we start in, in the beginning of time, we say we're just simply asking the question, what, what do I think this is? How well do I know x to start off with? Um, so if, we, if our knowledge just didn't have any correlation or anything, all this would be is a matrix where this is the standard deviation of, if we're still dealing with the bar balls, this is our standard deviation of x, this is our standard deviation of our y position knowledge, and then squared. So standard deviation squared is the variance, of course. Um, this will be x dot, and this will be y dot. And then the rest of these will all be zeros. Yeah, you get the idea. Okay. So that's what it be. So that's where we start in life, is we say, you know what, I don't really know these things. I might know them to within this or that, but, but that's about it. Um, I know that the rocket left me off somewhere over, uh, you know, Africa, right? And my velocity probably is pointing somewhere from Cape Canaveral to Africa. But I don't know a whole lot more than that. So it might be dispersed thusly. So this is called the prior knowledge. So this is what we knew kind of going in. So let's say that we're going from k to k plus 1. So if this is, if this is k, what on earth is p of k plus 1? So to do this, what we would need to know is the truth, which obviously we never know, um, and then our estimate, which is easy to know. But we can look at just this little error by itself. So let's start by just going to our equation here. If this is our equation for um, the truth, then our estimate It's just that, meaning we don't assume there's any noise. We assume the expected value of the noise is zero. Okay? Um, rather, we assume there's noise. We just assume that we don't know which direction it's in, and most likely it's zero. Uh, so that's how we're going to update our state. But let's take a, an expansion of this. Okay? Let's do a little linear expansion thing, a little uh, Taylor series here. So. Um, Let's make another like little point, a little error x, a little like dx, okay? So this is going to this plus some sort of like dx is the same as mapping that through here. So we're just going to end up with um, the map of, of this. partial difference multiplied by dx. Okay, right, we, rep we recognize the expansion going on here, plus higher order terms that we just don't care. Um, so what is, what is dx? Well, this is this. So uh, subtracting this from both sides, dx is just that. So we'll call this F, capital F. Okay? Cool. So this is kind of saying, if I had a little bit of error back here, how would that have mapped to an error later on? That's all. That's real simple. It's a linear map. And so this is what I mean when I say we assume the mean later 
uh, the mean originally maps to the mean finally. Um, so then we can say really simple things like this. Oh, my error is just linear. Okay, it's fantastic. Um, plus some noise term as well, okay? Plus the noise, which is not knowable. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to, so, so dx is really this whole thing right here. This is dx. So what is dx times dx, right? dx times dx transpose. Pretty trivial, isn't it? We've got f um, dx, and then uh, transpose. That's one of the terms. The other term is going to be, OK? And then the other terms are going to be right. We're just squaring this term, transposing and squaring. Um, so we'll have you know this times the transpose of that, this times the transpose of the noise, this times the that transpose of that, this times the transpose of the noise. Sorry, we're we're finding p here. We're on our way to p. Oh, okay. Like that's right. We're doing we're doing all the transposing because we're doing x. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're just trying to find dx times dx times dx transpose. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're going to end up with something that looks like this, and something looks like that, and something that looks like this, and then one more will turn down here that'll look like. Okay. So that's just multiplying inner, outer, everything else. That's just plain algebra. Um, cool. Now what we want to do is take a great big expected value of that. So what's the expected value of all of this? Well, um, expected values add. So we can just take the expected value of this and add the expected value of that and add the expected value of that and that. Okay. Um, if we assume that our noise is unrelated to any error we had in the state, which is pretty common, like the wind doesn't depend on how wrong I am about where the ball is, right? Um, then the expected value of these two together is zero. There's no correlation between the wind and where I expect the ball to be. And so that one's zero too. So we really just end up with the expected value of this plus the expected value of this. Okay. Cool. Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Um, F's are constant here, so we can just scoot those to the outside. And now we're just left with the expected value of this. And that's dx of k. Remember, this is all in terms of this little k. So wait a minute. That right there is just the covariance at k. And this is k plus 1. So all we have is just f times that, f transpose. So all we're doing is taking f putting it on both sides of our last covariance, and that's updated it for whatever f does. And then what's this? We actually haven't talked about this yet, but this is our noise. This is what we're assuming is noise in our system. So when you said, I'm going to make this system, what did you assume noise to be? Uh, whatever that is, we'll have an associated covariance. So this is probably called q, typically called q. And that's just a constant. It might change over time, but it doesn't have anything to do with your state. So just a little constant noise covariance that we add on. So we've actually already gotten through part of the filter right there. Um, cool. So let's ask some questions about this. Let's say that our system was a controlled system, okay, and it's trying to guide a state to zero. Um, let's say that it does it really, really, really quickly, okay, very fast, faster than our filter operates, okay. Then um, by the end of this, uh, 
f is going to drive everything to zero, right? The state after f is going to be zero. So um, no matter what our uncertainty is, the whole system is being driven towards zero. So what does that mean for our uncertainty? Zero times whatever our uncertainty was times zero, no uncertainty. We know after a sample that the state's at zero. Done. We know that. And then any noise in the system. So that kind of like makes some intuitive sense, right? Now let's say that the state is supposed to stay just exactly the same. The state is just sitting still. Um, in that case, f is going to be an identity matrix. The state's not changing. So what's this? Identity times this times identity. So our uncertainty doesn't change either. If we, don't, if we say the state doesn't move, then our uncertainty won't change. And then we add on noise. So that kind of makes a bunch of sense. If f explodes, if the you know, smallest little difference goes way out over here, then f's going to be enormous. Whatever uncertainty we have maps to just enormous uncertainty. And that makes sense too. Okay. So all this whole equation does, that's the first part of common filtering, is just say take our last uncertainty and propagate it. And this little f matrix does what our thousands of simulations did for the particle filter. Does that make a little sense? Just run them all into the future. Except here, instead of doing it with a bunch of individual particles, we said, I've just taken advantage of the dynamics of the system to give me that little update. Okay? Cool. So I'm going to erase this stuff. Yeah, I just made it on the screen. Taking, trying to take LaTeX notes too. So, what's that? I'm trying to take digital notes. So, oh, awesome. Oh, should have left that one. I'm glad I've gotten over the squeaking. Cool. All right, so how do we run an extended Kalman filter? Step one, this is our estimate. And then time or whatever other arguments go in there, okay? Cool, we know that, that's no big deal. Step two, update the covariance. Or maybe we calculate F. We'll show that here explicitly. Okay, so you usually do this by writing out on a piece of paper what your equations of motion are, taking the derivatives of them with respect to each state of x, and making this little matrix. And so, you know, if this is MATLAB, you know, you're, you're actually running a function like, you know, make f, and then you're plugging in your state estimate. Okay, so you're not doing this with like numerical differencing or any weird thing like that. You just literally write the math and, and then make it happen. Now this is what we just saw. So P, we'll call this updated, a little star. Sorry, couldn't make it. Sometimes if you have a nasty system, sometimes make up is numerical differencing, right? Cool, so the question is, if the system's really nasty, and it's hard to do the partial difference by hand, um, you could just do a numerical difference in order to come up with f. You could. You absolutely never should. In that case, you'd just run an unscented Kalman filter. Right. Because an unscented Kalman filter is going to require a lot less work than making f, and it's going to be more accurate. So if you ever find yourself doing numerical differencing here, stop and switch to an unscented Kalman filter. Does that make some sense? Yeah, that made a lot of sense. Awesome. Cool. So we've already seen this. We have P of K, okay? So this will be P star K plus one. Okay, star meaning we're not quite done, but this is a good update. Okay, so now we've conquered that equation. No big deal. Um, what do we do next? Well, in all the things that we've ta been talking about, we run a simulation to predict where the state will be. Then we predict what the measurement will be. And the measurement might be something you can see, like a position or a velocity, uh, or it might be something you can't see at all. 
um, or something that really has nothing to do with the state directly. So like imagine the way that I'm measuring the ball isn't that I magically get a position estimate of the ball. Imagine I have a little radar station down here or just a, you know, a guy with um, some little angles figuring out where the ball is. And all we get is angle over the ball and angle up, like we get elevation or something like that. Um, that angle is certainly not part of my state, but it might be the only thing I have to observe. So um, what we do is we form that estimated, we'll call it z hat, um, observation. So whatever our observation function is, form that. No mystery there, right? Okay. And now that we have this over here, I'm going to erase these. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at an equation that goes something like this. Uh, well, first let's make the innovation vector. The innovation vector says, it's a big name for a silly idea, how wrong is my observation? I get a real observation, that was my predicted observation. That difference is called the innovation. No big deal there, right? So, and that's our little innovation here. We can ask a question, what's our uncertainty in this? What's my uncertainty in my ability to predict that observation? Okay, so let's take a, let's take a little bit of a look at that. Um, if this is our equation, and then in truth, the real state goes through this equation to give us the observation, and there's noise on it. What is, what is the uncertainty of this? What's the covariance of this thing right here? So we can break down the equation for z and z hat and everything like we did for dx, or we could just look at this as kind of like a dz, just like we did for dx. And we'll come up with uh, another partial difference. And instead of calling that capital F, we'll call that H. Like we had F, little F, big F, little H, we'll call it big H. Okay. Um, so our uncertainty in our state here, which is represented by this guy, is going to go through this equation to give us our expected observation. So the uncertainty here naturally becomes uncertainty in our expected observation. Similarly, we have uncertainty in this alone because we know that in truth noise is added on over here. I don't observe it perfectly. Cool. So let's call that covariance of this um, S for no good reason. And it's going to have almost the same thing, the identical form. If Q was the covariance of my process noise, the part that added on to this, R is the covariance of my observation noise here. So it just adds on right there. So that's the uncertainty with this guy. And this is the uncertainty of this guy. In other words, we're just taking the uncertainty in what the state actually is. And just like we mapped out what was happening with the process, we're just mapping out what's happening with the observation. So this maps one way, and then because uncertainty, covariance is always this times that transpose, the error times the error transpose. Um, there's, there's one on this side and one on this side. So all those is map it out. Cool. So now we kind of understand what the uncertainty is with the innovation. And this, so we have two things. What's my uncertainty with my ability to predict the state? And what's my uncertainty with my ability to predict the observation of the state. And we can use those to kind of weight. How much do I trust this observation and how much do I trust my own prediction? Cool. So we're going to make something called the Kalman gain here. The Kalman gain is a matrix that tells us how much to trust one versus the other. So we'll call that K. And again, it looks a little bit funny, but this is really pretty clear. Uh, 
We're saying, here's my uncertainty and my ability to propagate. And then by, sti by sticking an H over here, I'm kind of mapping that uncertainty into the observation. Okay, it's just a map into observation. So this is my uncertainty with my ability to predict over um, sort of the overall uncertainty with the innovation. So let's think about what that means. You know, kind of think of this as like, you know, for a, for a scalar. Right? So if my uncertainty is really, really, really small, so there's almost no noise in my measurement, um, I don't have very much uh, uncertainty in my process, then my process and observation are going to be really good. Um, and uh, this will be pretty much one. This will sort of go to one. Uh, so if, uh, let's say that this R is just really big, okay? My noise on my observation is gigantic. Then that's going to make this bottom term much bigger than that top term. Okay, so I'm basically not going to trust my observation at all. I'm going to trust my propagation much more than I'm going to trust my observation. So is that to say you have like a really bad sensor? Yeah, yeah, like a really awful sensor. You know, if I'm trying to determine my position in this room and my sensor is uh, um, someone telling me what Wi-Fi network I'm connected to, great, I know I'm in Upson, wonderful, but it doesn't tell me that much about where I am or even where I am relative to where I just was. But if my position were my position on campus and I'm connected to Upson, okay, well actually now I know pretty decently where I am on campus. So what if I was connected to Upson a second ago, and like now I'm connected to Phillips? Okay, now we have an even better idea. And then if I'm still connected to Phillips over time, and assuming I'm, ha I'm not drunk walking my way around campus, then you know I'm probably going Upson towards Phillips, and I can get a good estimate on that. So it really just matters. Um, not it's always the noise versus the noise in my understanding. Because that's all we do. So how do we use this K? Before we talk too much about what all is going on with this K. How do we use it? Well, we use this to correct my estimate. So I said this was my updated estimate. OK. Um, but actually, I want to update that a little bit. So just like I had a little star on uh, the covariance, I could go back and put a star on each one of these. Like this is my naive little update. simple. So that's where I propagated my state to. That's my error in my observation. So that's a real observation minus what I predicted. And then we just gain from one to the other. So if the gain is really, really, really small, and that would be the case where S is really big because R is really big, the gain is really small. I'm basically just my prediction at the end of the day. Change it a little bit, and then over time, it'll change and change and change and change. Um, if k is pretty much uh, 1, right, sort of notionally 1, then I'm going all the way from what I predicted to what's implied by what I observed. So that'll pretty much just give me whatever change in state is supposed to happen in order to have gotten this number instead of this number. If you're Kalman filtering a serious system, k is, might be like a half, it might be like a tenth you know, thinking in scalar terms. So k is just how far you go from one to the other. Cool. So we've updated our estimate. And if we wanted to do this for one time step, we're actually done. We can, you know, wipe the chalk off our hands and go home. Um, but if I'm going to run this again, I'm about to get another sensor reading. So I want to propagate forward again. That means when I propagate forward, I'm going to need this for next time. Right? I'm going to need my knowledge of my uncertainty for next time. So we updated it here, but now I've updated my state. So now I need the uncertainty associated with this updated state. So you can imagine, OK, what is the uncertainty associated with my updated state? We'll call this PK plus 1. 
Now without a star. This means final. Okay. What is that? Well, it's the expected value of my final one of these minus the truth. Right? And we could go through all of this, and that would be excruciating. Um, but it becomes a fairly simple thing when you just simply walk through them. You just plug numbers in, take expected values, and walk through the math right here. We end up with uh, a much simpler thing. It's whatever it was, are predicted from over here. Um, this requires a lot of simplification to get down here, but it's still pretty intuitive in the end. Um, we have our covariance. No transpose here. We have our covariance. We kind of map that towards observation. So this uncertainty in the state, uncertainty in observation, kind of going one way, times k. So this is kind of how much uncertainty did we just remove by doing this process? And you know, remove here, right? So, um, so the K <clears throat> K H P sub K. Oh yeah, uh, that guy again. So okay. you could just make all this identity minus K H times P, and that's it. That's the whole Kalman filter. So instead of this being magic, we can just look at each one of these and go back to the particle filter example and say, cool. Um, this is like our big collection of false, or a big collection of particles. Those map outward into complete chaos as we go forward in time. And there's noise on those, so that's even worse. right? So this becomes bigger. Um, we predict the observation for each one of those. Here we just predict the observation for the middle. Um, we predict their error. And then we say, what's the uncertainty with the prediction, our ability to predict this? Which would be like for the particles, how widely spaced are all the predictions of all those little particles? And so that's all it is. We can always just ask ourselves, uh, how are all these little particles spaced out? Um, so if you want to test a filter, you can always just go do a thousand simulations and say, like, how spaced out are all these little particles? Does that add up to this number right here? Um, except this will be the observations of the particles. So um, here we do it by simply saying, well, it's my uncertainty in, in P mapped towards observation space, plus the error that just gets added on. And then we make a little bit of a gain here, which is really just you know, um, my ability to predict the observation over the total observation noise. And then we correct the state. And then we just account for the fact that we corrected the state, so we just take off a little bit of the uncertainty. Cool. That is the whole Kalman filter, the extended Kalman filter. If you want to look at a Kalman filter, you keep everything exactly the same, except uh, this equation becomes, instead of a nonlinear function, this just becomes h times x. Linear, yay. And this becomes f times x. Linear again, no big deal. So that's the actual Kalman filter. The, Kalman, the actual Kalman filter is kind of trivial, though, by, by comparison. This gets 100% of the ideas. All right, cool. So that's, uh, those are the main architectures that we're talking about. There are a lot of variations in all these things, but keeping those ideas in the head, like, okay, this is, you know, my uncertainty going out like this, uh, is the right way to think about this going through pretty much everything. Yeah. So sort of prior to all of this, to get the necessary ingredients, you would take your system, get your equations of motion, take some partial derivatives to find your f, and from there, and, and understand your sensors in some way, mm -hmm. and then from there you would have the, the necessary ingredients to... Yeah, yeah, that in fact, that's such a good question, let's actually just write that down somewhere. Let's... It's that understanding sensors thing, but I... It's still, like, it seems a little bit... Well, okay. Okay, yeah, so... 
let's, let's look at this as a process, and then let's talk about how you really, as a human being, go through the process. How about that? Okay. So for the, for the process, okay. um, you know, one, figure out your system. F and H. That's a little F. Yeah, they can't see that at all. Um, one, figure out F and H. Okay. Two, sit down and partially differentiate F and H symbolically. As functions of the state. Right. A lot of times you might be observing something that really just is the part of the state, like maybe you do get a real position. Um, in that case, you know, your H might just be identity or something like that. So H is usually a lot easier than F. Um, figure out F and H. Three, figure out uh, R and Q. So those were the measurement noise and the process noise. Between the two, the measurement noise is actually usually really simple. Okay, so if you go buy a sensor, you go look at the data sheet for that sensor, you like step through, step through, step through, um, you know, somewhere like at the end, uh, you get to something that tells you this sensor was tested and has these noise qualities. And they usually just give you either a standard deviation, so that'll just be um, one thing that you stick on one of the diagonals of R, or they'll give you a covariance matrix or something like this. So you usually just look up R. Um, Q is a lot harder. Q is, is much harder because I was saying, yeah, you know, Q is wind. But how does wind affect my body? If I'm looking at position and velocity, okay, wind affects my body because it creates drag and or lift. Um, and then that lift uh, is a function of a bunch of things. And that gives me an acceleration. The acceleration affects my velocity as noise because we can kind of multiply it by dt. Uh, so that gives me now the sort of dv, and then that affects my position is you know one half that noise acceleration times time squared. Um, more or less, that that would be how you could go through coming up with q. But that becomes a bit of an involved process if your state isn't like perfectly separable Cartesian things. Um, so q is actually where you have to sit down and do a lot of pencil and paper work. But that's just going to be necessary for anything but. Um, for anything in an extended Kalman filter. But now let's think about, let's take a step back to that unscented Kalman filter. Remember the noise could go into that function. I don't need to just add it on at the end. It could be one of the inputs to F. In that case, I can just take a draw on things I really care about. I could take a draw on the velocity of the wind in each axis or something like this. Then just simply run through the big equation and that affects the update of the state. I don't actually need to like map what that random draw would do to the state. I just take the random draw, stuff it in the function, and I end up with the state. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so R is something you generally look up, or if you don't have that from a data sheet or something, you take whatever your sensor is or the thing by which you're getting information about the world, and you maybe look at a known process, subtract out the known process, the rest is your noise, calculate covariance of that noise. Um, so, you know, if I know that truly my position is this, I get a million estimates of that. You know, I take my estimates minus my truth um, and maybe call that a little like matrix of errors. And then I just get the covariance of them, which, you know, MATLAB is just literally that. Um, so that would be how you go about finding that out. And again, here, these are all covariances assumed to be representing Gaussian processes, but uh, really an EKF can conquer just about anything that's uh, unimodal. Again, one lump of probability. EKFs still work really, really well. Okay. Uh, so it's nice when you have all these assumptions and things don't break when you violate them. Actually, uh, an EKF is, is sort of the AK-47 of filtering. Like it's a sort of a straightforward thing and it just works most of the time. I guess the final piece here, what's your initial uncertainty? 
and your initial state. Then, once you have that, you just set up the equations. The equations will just do the job. All right, cool. So now let's talk about where things begin to fall apart, okay? And we'll talk about how these go a little bit farther. Um, one of the first things that people will hear about Kalman filters and Kalman filters not working is that they have numerical problems. It's very common to hear about numerical problems. Um, some people hear uh, there are numerical problems and they throw their hands in the air and they say, my application is important. I can't have anything that has numerical problems. I'm going to use this naive technique that doesn't work, but at least it doesn't have numerical problems. Um, and I've seen that way too frequently. Um, so let me show you where some numerical problems can come in. Right here, we're doing this subtraction. Okay. Computers represent numbers not perfectly. They always kind of have some round off error and things like this. So we have this subtraction. But this is supposed to be a covariance matrix. This must always be symmetric. Just think about the, uh, you know, x times x hat. Always going to be symmetric. And um, it should always have positive eigenvalues. If you think about a little eigen decomposition, the eigenvalues are kind of your uncertainty along some weird axes, okay? It doesn't matter what those axes are. The eigenvalues would just be uncertainty that maps. Remember when we were drawing the little ball and we did this and we did this and I said this was one axis and this is the other axis? Those axes will be the eigenvectors. That will be your eigenvalue. So those have to be positive. Your uncertainty has to be positive. But because of round off and stuff, when you subtract something, you might get such that this ends up with negative values for eigenvalues. You don't look at it and necessarily see negative values. Um, or you might. You might see on the, on the diagonal one little tiny value that's negative. Holy cow, that's a problem. I'm saying my uncertainty is a number squared, and that number is negative, right? So that's a problem. And this does really happen. So um, for violet, I mentioned that I started with an unscented Kalman filter to see what its performance could be, because that was easy. Extended Kalman filters are generally a little bit faster than unscented Kalman filters, so I made an unscented, I mean I made an extended Kalman filter next. The extended Kalman filter worked just as well as the unscented Kalman filter. Um, but um, what I found after running the simulation for a really long time, and our knowledge became really good in our state estimate, is eventually doing this little form right here caused this to go negative. Just slightly negative, but negative for a moment. Once that's a negative, then everything just explodes through the rest of the filter, okay? Um, naturally, we'd like to avoid that. So there are a lot of ways to avoid that. One is to use something called Joseph form. For this update right here, which just looks a little bit different. Um, if you're looking at a textbook, you know, to implement a Kalman filter or something, use Joseph form if you can. It takes it this much more processing, but it's much more stable. Um, it looks like this, just for kicks. But you'll find it in any book. Um, so now what I'm doing is I'm forming a matrix here. I'm multiplying this on each side by that matrix. So that's a symmetric operation plus, plus is safe, another symmetric matrix. So things will be fine. So we have a little bit more to do because here we just had this, you know, one matrix multiply, two matrix multiplies and subtract. Here we have one matrix multiply, a subtract. Um, a matrix multiply, a matrix multiply, we already have this, maybe a transpose, another matrix multiply, another, and then plus. So it's a little bit more. But overwhelmingly, that matrix inverse is dominating the runtime anyway. So a Joseph form is a great idea if P might get small. With like modern processors, how necessary is using an extended column filter versus an unscented Love it. Fantastic question. Okay, so the question is, with modern processors, is it really advantageous to be using an extended Kalman filter when you could just be using an unscented Kalman filter? Um, if you're running on a PC, there's almost no reason you would use an extended Kalman filter. You could just use an unscented Kalman filter and everything will be fine. Uh, the difference in speed 
varies with the problem. Uh, people will say that an unscented Kalman filter is the same order of like big O notation as an extended Kalman filter. It depends how complicated your simulation function is. Um, in filters that I've worked with, unscented Kalman filters generally take about twice as long to run. So if you want to cut your runtime in half, running an extended Kalman filter might do it. Um, Even if you parallelize? Yeah, yeah. So I would say on a PC, I wouldn't bother. I would, you could parallelize these. But honestly, these tend to be so fast that the overhead in doing parallelization is not there. Unless it's a really complicated function. Um, but a lot of people are using these in robotics or they are doing these on satellites or UAVs or something like that. And then your processor is some 16 megahertz thing. You know, it's about as powerful as my mechanical watch. Um, and then you want to go for these minimal forms. I guess, I guess the question is, isn't that changing, that fact? No. No. Okay. No. Because you still want high power. I mean, you still want low power and you want right. good accuracy and things. Extended column filters are still extremely common um, on on robots that don't have tons of power to burn. Right. Uh, so yeah, you can go get a high power filter and put it on something, but right. um, a modern UAV might still be using, uh, without naming anything in particular, you know, a 16 megahertz processor or um, a 72 megahertz processor or something like this. It might be using like a weak arm right. uh, Cortex processor. Um, and do you see that changing? Not really. Okay. Not really. It, it's wasteful uh, because the extended common filter is not hard to run. Right. It's not hard to do. Uh, on PCs, yeah, don't bother. Yeah. Just PCs, UKF, and you're done. Or particle filter, and you're done. Whatever. But particle filter is still like thousands of times slower than UKF. So UKF is advantageous. Or I'll see people splitting things up. So you can do like part particle filter on some of the really weird stuff, and then do like an internal little EKF on some other states that are predictable as a linear system and have unimodal properties. So how do you, how do you piece those? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> That's way beyond the scope of this. Okay. Um, Could you send us like like re, like the useful resources that you know of? When yeah. You're yeah, absolutely. I'll send some useful resources. The internet is infinite and we can pair it yeah. a little bit. That okay. Great. Yeah. On the subject of resources. Um, it's, Wikipedia has a good article for Kalman filtering. Beyond that, it's hard to find good resources if you search for techniques of anything but the absolutely generic Kalman filter. None of the things that we're about to talk about. Um, you'll find a lot of presentations and then for some reason you have to download a PowerPoint and uh, yeah. um, books are still overwhelmingly the best place to look for well-tested and understood filter architectures, and I'll, I'll send some book links, and then um, academic papers for getting into any really specific application stuff. So if you wanna make a common filter for a spacecraft that has a sun sensor and a magnetometer and a gyro, cool, go read this paper, it says how to do it. Um, so journals are the best place to find specific instances for things like that. Uh, journals are always state of the art, so. Um, okay, so you can use a Joseph form here. Uh, however, Kalman filters, let's, like history lesson. So we said we've gone back 50 years. So what happened 50 years ago? A guy named Kalman took a look at the Apollo program. He said, hey, this is pretty neat. How are you guys actually going to use thrusters to get to the moon? I'm like, well, we're going to point them really well. How are you going to point them? I'm like, okay, well, we don't know. Um, we're going to try to figure that out. Uh, so this guy named Kalman figured out this type of filtering, was already working on it, saw the Apollo program, and just kind of said, hey, hey, you might want to like do this thing I'm kind of working out right now. So he put out the Kalman filter paper, and everyone went like, hey, this is really cool. They implemented a bunch of Kalman filters, and they all fell apart. They all had numerical problems. Keep in mind, the computers back then were rare, <laughs> um, not used in vehicles at all. Um, so... It was fairly difficult, and the word sizes, we weren't dealing with like 32-bit floating point or 16-bit floating point. We're talking about like 20-bit like floating point or something. Awful, awful. So, you know, they're talking like, hey, sweet, I have four significant digits of precision. Great. You know, it's not, not very good. So they had all sorts of numerical problems. 
And it's one of those things kind of like, who would ever need more than whatever number of kilobytes of RAM or, or whatever? It's one of those same things. Like, common filters will never matter, matter to aerospace. They were invented for aerospace, and they were sort of discarded. And then a few people said, I bet we can do this. I bet we can do this. One guy was named Schmidt. His name's all over the place in aerospace, common filtering. Um, but right after Kalman came up with his excellent paper deriving these equations, not the intuitive approach that we just went through, but actually deriving why this is optimal for a linear system and whatever. Um, like a couple years after that, someone looked at this and was like, okay, that's, that's great, but we have these numerical properties. What if instead of representing the uncertainty as P, the, covariance, the full covariance, what if I just took a sort of square root of P? So imagine taking the square root of your uncertainty. Um, you know, zero is still zero, but uh, you can represent um, a broader range in a shorter range with a square root operation, right? So I only use two to represent four. I only use three to represent nine. So everything's kind of squished in there. So I don't actually need to represent numbers that are as big anymore. So he said, cool, I just want to take your filter and I just want to do a great big square root of your filter, right? And that's exactly what he did. And stunningly, this guy did this about two years after Kalman's paper. And he did all of these filter dynamics, all of these equations and everything. He did, instead of with P, with a um, square root of P. And I'm going to erase EKF and I'm going to put it there. So imagine that we do a UDU composition of P. What that means is we decompose P into matrices like this, a U matrix and a D matrix. D is just diagonal. You can see that, okay. D is just diagonal, and U is upper uni triangular, so U looks like one something, 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 zero, one, something, something, zero, zero, one, something, okay? So he said, okay, let's, let's do that. Now let's just take u to u and let's put it in here and here and here um, and over there. And you know, obviously I'm not saying u to u equals, I just want to update u and I just want to update d and then I want to kind of have square root of all this other stuff everywhere. Um, burning question? No. Burning. Okay. Um, so he rederived this whole filter in terms of this u to u. So all the uncertainty gets represented in d now, which is diagonal, easy to update. And then U is this little matrix. And U and D change over time. But suddenly, the numerical problems just disappeared. They just totally went away. So this will be called a UD filter. And these are fantastic. Um, if you can work with doubles and you can, you know, 64-bit floating point numbers, eh, it doesn't matter that much. But uh, a lot of people are still working with like 32-bit floating point types, singles. Um, if you have to work with worse, then I'm really sorry. But a UDU filter can absolutely manage it, except in like really super strange cases that you seek out only to say that, look, I found one that doesn't work. So pretty much UU filters always do the job. Interestingly, they aren't significantly more processing power. You can't really say they are this or they are this. It's exactly the same big O. And then in terms of what they're running, it's, it's like a trivial little tiny difference in the runtime. So um, UD filters are fantastic. So with that, numerical problems are gone. If you ever hear someone saying you can't do column and filtering because of the numerical problems, call them ignorant, and then show them real papers and say, like, this problem was solved 60 years ago. Like, how old is your source? Right? OK. You about to ask something? Could you just throw out the bottom half of the P star matrix and then flip it around? Throw out the bottom half? Yeah, would that be a legitimate way of trying to get around numerical errors? This is supposed to be symmetric, right? So just flip the upper triangle. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that would make sure it remains symmetric. Mm -hmm. So will this operation down here, the Joseph form? Um, if you want to make this a really efficient operation, yeah, don't multiply every little bit of every matrix. You can just multiply and fill up the upper triangle, but you can still end up with negatives on the diagonal. You still end up with negative values represented as eigenvalues in P. Isn't there something about all symmetric matrices have positive eigenvalues? Isn't there some relationship between them? Yeah, that's the problem. This is actually, this form can lose its symmetry. Um, and what you're saying is this form is losing its symmetry, but I'm not calculating the bottom 
I'm simply be... forcing it to be diagonal, but uh, you can still end up with negative eigenvalues in there. Or you'll, you'll still end up with garbage anyway if you try to do that. Okay. You can't just mandate that it yeah. obey the laws you want it to. You have yeah. to actually do some math. Are yeah. they equivalent though? Like the top one and the Joseph one? What's that? Are they actually numerically equivalent? Like what's the error? Great question. So, so the question is, is this little form and this, are they numerically, are, are they equivalent? Um, they are exactly equivalent if k is that. And you can show this, and it'll take a while. But you can show that they are exactly equivalent, k and everything all just, whoosh, and this turns into that, which is cool. Interestingly, sometimes, rarely, but sometimes you want to change k. You want to say, okay, cool, this is, this is great, that's what my Kalman gain should be. I'm just going to multiply that by half. You know, I don't want to go as far as the Kalman gain tells me I should go from this to this. So I'm just going to multiply that by half. Okay? Um, then this no longer gives you this. In fact, this is the right form. This is a simplified form only in the case that k is optimal. This is optimal. When would you want k to be half? Or half of that. You just you want to govern how far you go from the prediction to the measurement. So you might say, um, I actually want to hold back closer to my prediction more than the dynamics say that I should. Don't do that. But you could. I only mention it because she asked if they're equivalent. Right. Um, only in optimal K. This is right for any K. K doesn't have to have anything to do with Kalman filtering. This is true for any map that you do right here. So I could take a random value, like random k, run this equation, that would then represent my uncertainty associated with the updated x. That's definitely not obvious, but that's true. Could people, I had always thought of, if you want to tune how much you trust your, uh, your update, then you just tune q. You're exactly right. So he's uh, saying that Goodness, why would you do that? And I kind of agree. But it has been done historically, and that's all. Okay. This is true for a generic K. There are other places where there are operations that you add on to this, um, such that K won't be the optimal K by the time you get down here. I'll give you an example, and it will answer one of your earlier questions. So, in fact, it's a great segue right now. Let's say I have this system. I'm representing the dynamics as best I know them. I have a state that I care about. That state evolves over time. I'm basically running these equations and updating my notion of the state. But now let's say that I recognize that this isn't just a computer simulation where um, air density is what I say air density is. And it's the same for the true model that I run and for the dynamics used in the filter. Maybe the air density is a little bit different. Okay? So you could say, oh, simple. Add air density to your state, estimate air density. And that would work to a degree, assuming air density is observable. Okay, I'm not going to talk about observability, but um, it might be that you can observe like one thing but not another, or this thing but not that. Kind of like if you had x times y equals c, and all you get is c. You can never tell if it's x or y. All you can, you know. Um, so uh, I want to acknowledge that there's uncertainty in here, but I don't want to just estimate every single parameter that might have uncertainty associated with it. Okay. Um, so I do that with a little extra covariance, and this is called consider covariance because it allows you to consider the effect that your dynamics are wrong. Uh, so you can take every little number that's inside of F, okay, uh, all your air density type things, gravity, um, whatever it is. You take all these little numbers and you say these have covariance too. Uh, so you come up with a covariance for each of those individually. Like, I know air density is not going to be, you know, negative, right? Um, so you, you come up with some notion of what air density might be in the region you're flying or something like this. You represent those with uh, a covariance matrix. Usually that's constant. Then when you go through these equations, and we remember how we kind of came up with this equation right here by taking this running it, taking the Taylor series expansion and all this business, um, and we calculate the expected value in order to get here, if we allow that these parameters also have uncertainty, we'll have other terms added on over here. 
something like f for your consider COVID, uh, consider parameters. So this will be still this type of operation, but now instead of with your state, with respect to your consider parameters, times stuff. Okay, so you'll you'll still get more things to add on right here. Um, that those are way more equations than we can go through, um, and to try to make them intuitive, but it's a very realistic thing to do in a filter scenario. So we add consider covariance on, it will affect this equation, it will affect this equation, all the way through. Interestingly, your gain will no longer be optimal because you're not estimating the consider parameters because it's just too much work. You don't really care what they are. You just want to acknowledge that there's uncertainty in them. So your gain is no longer optimal. Ah, so now you can't use this form. And now you have to use this form. Okay. So if you're looking into something like this, consider parameters are the place to look. And again, they're unestimated things that also have noise with them. We didn't need this on Python. Cool. Okay. So for reference, on some of these things, um, I mentioned Coleman did his paper in the 60s. Another guy came out a couple years later with UD filter. UD filter works fantastically well. Um, this was what was used to actually get us to the moon. And this was the first application of Kalman filtering, um, really at all. Right? It was used to sometimes predict some orbits and things, but this was used to get us over to the moon um, and ran on a dinky little computer that was, I think, I think it was eight megahertz as a computer. Uh, programmed by him. Yeah. What did they even use for sensor measurement? I don't know. I don't know exactly what they were using for that. But yeah, it was an 8 megahertz processor. Um, today, I made a UAV. Not, not I made a UAV today, but you know, in modern times, I have made a UAV. And battery life's a big deal. I need this thing to fly as long as it can. So I have a 16 megahertz processor on there. And I'm running a very similar type of Kalman filter, UD filter as a matter of fact, on this little tiny processor. And um, yeah, it's really just not much more glorious than the original Apollo computer. You know, we always hear about you know, whatever is equivalent to the computational power of the space shuttle, but uh, the Apollo computer was way ahead of its time in terms of the fact that it operated at megahertz and not kilohertz was sort of a big deal. Of course it was. Yeah, yeah it was about yay big, something like that. Something like that. Where, yeah, mine is, you know, I don't know. I'd probably lose it in the sand, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, but there's one more thing that I needed to do to get to the speed. So we've talked about the numerical stability. Um, let's talk about speed, okay? Overwhelmingly, this is the slow operation in Kalman filtering. This great big matrix inverse you have to do right here, okay? But there's a neat, there's a neat thing inside of Kalman filtering. So this was, my, this was my propagation base. So I'm gonna draw a line through here. For the correction, I want you to imagine that the error in every sensor is uh, linearly independent, okay? So there, there's no covariance between the noise in one sensor and the noise in another sensor. This is a pretty good approximation. Um, very rarely are you gonna have noise sources in entirely different devices that are the same noise source. Uh, so if that's the case, I can, I can run through all these equations for a single sensor and in that case, for a single sensor, um, this is going to be a scalar. This is what I mean by single sensor. That's a scalar. If this is the covariance of that, that's a scalar. Uh, this is a row. Um, so right here, that is a scalar. So dividing a scalar is a lot easier than doing an inverse of a matrix. So if I can find that my R here just has diagonal elements and zeros everywhere else, then I can just run this n times, where this is dimension n. I can run this n times. And so now, instead of doing one big matrix thing, yeah, I'm doing all line equations n times, but that's still much faster, much, much, much faster. So uh, if I tried to do a nine state inverse on my UAV, it takes it about four seconds 
which is a problem. Um, when I separate this into diagonals like that, I basically set up my observation, I set up what I call my sensor thing in order to obtain a diagonal form here. Now I just run that in a loop and um, I can do that at 10 hertz. You know, so 0.1 seconds instead of 4 seconds. That made the difference in the airplane flying or not flying. I mean, the dirty secret of computers doing matrix math is that unless there's like special properties of the matrices that it takes into account, it's really just doing for loops anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of ways to do a good matrix inverse on a computer. Uh, one safe way, it's not the fastest way, safe way is uh, to do a singular value decomposition and then invert each of the singular values and then make sure those are bigger than zero before you invert them. So there's one way you can do it, but a singular value decomposition takes a long time. Or you can use LU or um, other decompositions. Regarding the independence assumption, mm -hmm. what do you do if you have, say, like two accelerometers? Do you mm -hmm. do a, like, pre, because those would have uh, correlated nodes, right? So, good question. So uh, you're asking about the accelerometers uh, if you have two accelerometers, those will have correlated noise. I would say no. The, they will have, there will be some actual acceleration on your vehicle from wind and stuff like that, but that's actual acceleration on your vehicle. The measurement of that acceleration um, and the noise on that measurement is still probably unrelated. So one place where, where the independence assumption would go away would be, be to say you're not taking into account temperature effects. Temperature effects result in errors that are biased one way. All your sensors are the same um, uh, wired, temperature. Or do wire things badly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that would cause okay. problems. So from here, we've talked about numerical stability. We've talked about speed. Doing these things properly, you can make um, either a filter that uses this or like a UDU filter. You can use scalar updates. It's called scalar or sequential updates because we do them in a sequence. And you can make blazing fast, stable, calm filters, and it's not hard to do. I mean, it takes time, but you can get there. Um, there's no magic in it anyway. Um, we can add on consider covariance and consider things that we don't know, how uh, additional uncertainty affects the dynamics of everything. So with all that in there, how do we know that we're right? How do we know that our filter is running properly? Okay. Here I'm not going to draw this because it would take far too long. But every step of the way, we have two covariance matrices. We've got this guy, and we've got this guy right here. So what I can do, if I'm simulating my filter, I can simulate the truth, simulate what the real measurement is, and you know there's true process noise, and then there's true observation noise. And then all I do is take those observations and stuff them into the filter along with the prior estimate, run the filter, that gives me an updated estimate, and then I look at the updated estimate versus the truth and I get the real error. So I can record the real error. So if I record the real error over time, and I record the covariance over time, then I can simply look at the real errors and say, do the real errors have the covariance um, that this is saying I should have over time? Or more to the point, can I take each error and sort of divide it by the covariance for that sample, sort of normalizing it by its uncertainty? Then I should get um, a normalized error, and I should be able to say 95% of the data points should fall under some 95% criterion for um, a normal distribution, you know, with a, a standard deviation of one. So whatever that number is, um, make sure it'll be a high square distribution. Make sure that all those points fit inside of there. Do I end up with like 90 out of 100 points fitting inside that boundary? That's probably fine. Do I end up with like 10 out of 100 points fitting inside that boundary? There's a problem. Okay. So you can do these types of tests. Uh, and a great source for this is, um, is Barshalom's book, which will be in the things I send out. Um, he has a series of tests that are great. Similarly, we can look at the errors in our estimate versus the truth and our covariance, and we can look at the errors in our prediction and this covariance and do the exact same process to make sure that 
95% of these are within some sort of 95% boundary. And 95%, of course, is completely arbitrary. Okay, so in that way we can then go through and test. So now we can start with easy filters, particle filters, unscented Kalman filters, extended Kalman filters, um, move down towards forms that we're comfortable with. Any step of the way, um, or, or rather, as, as we're going in this direction, we can begin to make better filters and we can test them to make sure those are good all the way through and fast and everything else. So that's we're in good shape. Yeah. How do you, if you don't have, like if you're running it on a real system, mm -hmm. if you're testing a real system, mm -hmm. is there any way to know how well your filter is doing besides is the system doing what I want it to do? Sure. There's a bit of a way to do this. A little bit of a way to do this. So the question is, in the real system, not the one where I'm running this filter in a simulator, but I go put this out in the real world, and I want this thing to go beep, beep, beep when its filter is not doing well. How does it know its filter isn't doing well? Because this isn't a simulation. We don't have access to truth. Uh, one way is to look at the assumptions that are built in here and start to determine if those assumptions are being violated at some point. One assumption is that this should be uncorrelated sample to sample. The noise on this, the, this error, over time should be white. So I can do an autocorrelation of this over time, sort of a running autocorrelation, and determine if that's white enough for the filter. That's also talked about in Barcelon. That's, uh, that's about all you get, though. You can also, at any given point, like especially if you have UDU form, look at your D, and did anything go nuts, right? Do I have one term that's just exploding? That might indicate that um, something has gone wrong in the system. Not necessarily the filter, but maybe something broke. Maybe a sensor is going nuts. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. I think that's I think that's pretty good. We can talk about some specific filters, filter ideas, maybe for the last ten minutes or so. Because I think yeah, we're coming up on time. Okay. So let's talk about one that is always confusing. And that'll be IMU type filters. So very often when you're dealing with Kalman filtering, you're doing it in the context of a controlled system. It's often controls engineers that do Kalman filtering. Not always, for sure. And so you're talking about the system you're doing filtering on as something like, you know, xk plus 1 equals fxk plus you know, gu, whatever. Um, and that little f is the same f and everything. Here I'm showing it as linear, but we could consider this as a dx instead, and that would all be fine. Uh, dx, dx, du. Um, so we consider all that, and we know that this is ultimately coming from some function that maps x, k, time, u, to the plus one. So we look at this and we're like, okay, that's clearly the control input. Part of what gets really weird with um, IMU filters is uh, we actually don't model the system uh, in terms of maybe the dynamical system. If I have a spacecraft, for an IMU type filter, I don't model the torques on the spacecraft. I don't model the environmental stuff that's happening to it. I don't model how the actuators work. You don't do any of that. The reason is, it's hard. It's really hard. And we have good IMUs. So an IMU at any given moment is going to tell me my rotation rate. Yeah. So with that rotation rate, I can simply propagate that rotation rate forward and determine how that's affected my orientation later on. Um, alternately, I could say my input, let's say this input was uh, currents going to torque coils. Okay, that current goes to a torque coil. It takes it this long for this to actually like ramp up. Um, that creates a magnetic dipole. The magnetic field is this. That means I get a torque like this. That torque gives me this acceleration. I can integrate that acceleration. So 
with my current rotation rate to get the effect on my orientation. That's a huge system. And there are tons of things that are unknown in there. Uh, and tons, tons of things that are sloppy. Like maybe I, I command something, but it's actually like a few samples before I get that command because of communication delays going over to the thing that actually generates the current and things like this. Um, IMUs, on the other hand, are really accurate. So I can bypass the, all the modeling of all of the system by simply using a decent IMU. And the IMU says, okay, yeah, well, whatever you commanded, that's lovely, but uh, here's what your rotation rate is. And you get your rotation rate. It also has some noise on it, but you get it. So instead of this being any sort of control thing and us modeling our whole system from acceleration, we just model it from rotation rate up. Well, that's just uh, the kinematics, right? That's simple. Or wait, did I switch those? No, that's the kinematics, right? I was going to be yeah. confused. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's confusing because kinematics has an MA in it, but it doesn't have <laughs> Nice. I like that. I like that heuristic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So in that case, what is this little U? Well, we can look at this separately. U is whatever I want to affect my system. So for something like an IMU type filter, U is actually just going to be the rotation rate measurement. So it's awkward in a thing like this that one thing that we're measuring, we're measuring our rotation rate, um, isn't used in our measurement vector. It's used as our input vector. That's how you are rotating. And then a measurement vector for a system like this, uh, Z, might consist of maybe you get a quaternion from a star tracker. Um, you could get uh, angles to the sun from a sun sensor. You could get uh, magnetic field reading from a magnetometer. So maybe that is your measurement vector. So it gets really weird. Um, because you think about this, you're like, well, this has noise in it, and the filter assumes that uh, the input vector is precise. At no point going through this did we assume that there was an input vector that was also a random variable that would have affected all the expectations and whatever. So wait, 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 how do I do this? Um, and what's the process noise? I don't know, what, what on earth is the process noise? Oh, this is sensing the rotation rate. Well, so this is really the real rotation rate plus some error. So we say that the process noise is that error in our ability to sense. Okay. And so then we have to work out how that error affects our state update. So this is definitely a really different way of thinking because um, people are used to having to model their whole system for Kalman filtering. And yet, in one of the most common applications of Kalman filtering, you don't model really the system at all. All you model is just uh, the integration of of rotation rate up to orientation. So I wish someone had told me this years ago. Um, is there a good way to then back out your actual applied torque? I guess it would be do the inverse kinematic, like actually do inverse kinetics um, on your yeah. state. There are, I can think of numerous ways to answer your question for numerous motivations. The question is, can we back out the torque on the system? Um, I mean, I could be completely naive about it, and I could simply say, you know, I got this rotation rate at k plus 1. I got that rotation rate at k. Right? Right. And then um, that's giving me kind of a w dot, or an omega dot. Um, and I know that omega dot is going to be the inverse of the moment of inertia to torque minus. Whenever you do that with real measurements, it differentiating real measurements is always uh, yeah. horrific. Yeah. Um, these have tiny noise. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's still going to become more noise. It's going to become that noise, you know, times a big number if dt is small, for sure. Right. Um, but, I mean, this gives you a notion of it. But why do you care what your torque is? Uh, well, the application I was actually thinking of is I was trying to use a common filter to back out the force that uh, an actuator was producing. And I can only, like, and I had 
noisy measurements of trying to like smoosh them together with a common filter. So this may not be the exact way to do that. If the change in force is slow, you can make the force part of the state. Yeah. You'll get down, it'll back drive effectively what your estimate of that force is over time. Um, that's one way you could do it. Another way, if it's complicated, is you can use system identification techniques. That's, that's we're not there yet. Um, there are other things you can do to identify the overall system, like in line with Kalman filtering. Um, all of them are hard, <laughs> but they're, they're possible. Uh, there's something called an observer Kalman filter model, where you kind of learn about your system as you're going through the system. Um, these, these types of things are in there. I would say make, making the force part of your state would probably come up with it estimating the force. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's not changing super quickly. If it's changing from sample to sample really fast, then you're not going to get anything. You're just going to get noise, kind of like this would give you noise. I mean, since the dynamics go one way, the dynamics go another way, the Kalman filter will kind of drive it down to that. Another thing is, uh, specifically for IMUs, we assume that the, the rotation rate is bias. So the measured rotation rate is the true rotation rate plus a bias plus uh, noise. Okay. This bias is usually part of the state that is estimated over time. It also changes over time. It's not constant, but it changes slowly. So we can estimate this over time. So the omega that's used right here is the measurement minus our current estimate of the bias. We ignore noise. It's really very small. And that's what we use right in here. That noise becomes that. And that's what's used in our Q matrix. How, how fast do you use IMU sample? How fast do IMU sample is also a good question. This is going to tie in also the notion of, you know, aren't computers fast enough? Right. Um, sure, computers are fast enough, but don't you want to run your filter faster? <laughs> A lot of times the answer is just plain, yeah, like higher bandwidth control comes with faster time step, end of story. So uh, you might want to run it a little bit faster. Um, so IMUs might run 400 hertz is not fast. Um, 1,000 hertz is not that fast. Going beyond there, you get into like classified ranges, but things run much faster than that. Uh, so... The thing is, you might not need to actually run your Kalman filter so as to keep up with your IMU. You can sort of group IMU measurements together to come up with an overall impulse for how your orientation has changed, right. and then estimate more slowly. But if you care about orientation at every point in time, like mm -hmm. if, if you really want to sort of draw a smooth curve of orientation in mm -hmm. real time, then you can't batch like that. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, but usually, this is changing really small. Uh, you don't really estimate rotation rate ever inside these IMU type filters. This is this you're estimating. This is small. So even if you're running at a thousand hertz and you're only updating your filter at a hundred hertz, you know for that tenth of, uh, of whatever it is of the samples, um, using this as the same value between them, it's fine, and you're going to be able to get it. It's just it won't be like perfectly corrected at each little one. It'll have a little bit of error and then a little janky thing and then a little bit of error and a little janky thing and a little bit of error. But I mean, we're talking really small because these change very slowly. So once you start estimating these, they pretty well just kind of like lock in and random walk around a little bit. But So that's IMU type filtering. There's an equivalent thing for accelerometers and position and velocity. But uh, this is what's done really frequently for orientation. I think that covers... Most of the things that I had planned to talk about today. Did I tell you I was going to talk about anything else? I don't think so. I think that does all of it. I'm satisfied. Cool. Cool. Yeah, so, like I said, when I started out, my filters were, were pretty bad. They were slow. I had numeric problems and things like that. Um, so this has been acquired over about a decade of doing this stuff. And uh, it would have been nice to have kind of an intuitive guide through this. So I hope that if you can keep an intuitive notion always about what's going on inside your heads, it'll be a lot easier to get in and understand all the weird little things that are going on. And if you want to actually build a filter, uh, hopefully there are several different avenues you might go down, like consider covariance and things like that, or filter this. So, okay?
So when you're actually implementing it, like what what tickers do you look at? Like what what do you use to say like what's your go to? Ah, this is working. You just like, you do the math it? really well. Don't mess up the math. Be really careful. Don't do that at 4 a.m. after you know an all nighter the night before. Um, and then uh, I look at those plots at the end that I was talking about of the normalized error and see that those are about where they're supposed to be. You call it consistent when your filter covariance matches your actual error covariance. So I look at those. When I see those, those are doing well, and then I can run the filter for a very large number of samples until the gain is virtually the same every time and the covariance um, it has sort of settled into place uh, and make sure that I don't see any numerical problems. And then I say, cool, good filter, and we're done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I will hit stop now. Bye, guys.